Welcome everyone and uh, thanks for joining us this evening. My name is Ravi Panekka. I lead the team and group coaching community of practice for ICF Bangalore Charter Chapter. The duration of today's masterclass is one and a half hours with the final 15-20 minutes designated for Q&A. Today's masterclass entails one and a half uh, CCUs, which means a full one and a half core competencies. And uh, participants who attend the full session would be awarded CC certificates by the chapter. Now, let me introduce Tammy. Tammy Turner, CEO of uh, Turner International, is passionate about co-creating organizations of the future. She's a master certified coach MCC and a team coach certified by both the ICF Accredited Team Coach Advanced Certification AATC and the EMCC Individual Team Coaching Accreditation, which is ITCA. Tammy is also an EMCC Accredited Master Practitioner and holds a Global Individual Supervision Accreditation, GISA. As one of the most internationally experienced coaches, Tammy has been coaching teams and groups at all levels since 2001. She has also supervised and mentored coaches, enhancing their impact on the wider organization. Over the years, she has coached more than 100 teams and groups and has trained, mentored, and supervised internal coaches, team coaches, leaders, and HR professionals. Tammy shares her wisdom and real-world experience to advance both novice and experienced coaches. As a visionary in the coaching industry, she has authored over 25 books and articles on team coaching, coaching supervision, and multicultural coaching. Tammy is the recipient of the 2023 EMCC Global Award in Supervision. I'm both thankful and grateful to you, Tammy, for taking the time to host the masterclass on supporting our collective future, engaging teams and organizations in team coaching. A very warm welcome to you once again, Tammy, on behalf of ICF Bangalore Char Charter Chapters, uh, team and group coaching community of practice. Over to you, Tammy. Wow, thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, everybody, for taking time out of your evening uh, to come spend time with us. My request is that because we're giving the full 1.5 CCEUs for this program, the there will be quite a bit of interaction. And so if we can come off camera as much as possible, that would be great. I'm really cool with people eating, you know, having uh, kids come in and say goodnight, whatever it is to make it, um, you know, kind of fit into your life. But equally, if we can make sure that people are actually physically here, that would be great because you do get the full CCEs for the time. So, and being ex um, director of professional standards for ICF. I know um, everybody takes their ethics quite seriously. So, so today we are going to be speaking about. Um, oops, I need um, screen sharing, please, Robbie. Sure. Um, I um, we're going to be talking about supporting our collective future, and how do we engage teams and organizations in team coaching. And I know that, um, oh, thank you. I know that we've got um, some people here who um, professional team coaches who've done um, one of the programs that I have taught, et cetera. So let me just do one thing at a time here. There we go. Um, so we'll love to have uh, people put in their own perspectives, because although I've been doing the work since 2001 as an individual coach and probably a few years after that working with teams and groups, what I have found in the years is that you can never know enough. And one of the things that, um, for those of you who've heard me speak before on this that I'm quite passionate about is, the, is complex adaptive systems. And whether you're one-to-one -one or one-to-many, those complex adaptive systems are actually really important because we don't work in isolation. We actually have another human being we're connecting with. And, you know, what happens between the two of us is what makes coaching work. So we'll talk a little bit about that today. I'm really curious to find out what people would like to learn today. So 
if you can put that in the chat box as we're going, that would be awesome. So far, we've heard people really want to know about the certification, which I haven't put anything in here on, but we will talk about since that's a requirement. And um, what we will do is talk quite a bit about comparing and contrasting the one-to-one -to, -one to the one-to-many sort of environment, a little bit about some of the tools you could be using, et cetera. Um, now, I have a couple of requests from you guys from a contracting perspective is that if I do not get your name correct, please correct me because obviously I'm just a guaylo. So although I have spent some time in India, um, I, uh, I sometimes don't get those pronunciations correct. So please feel free to say your name um, and come off of, off of uh, microphone. And if I don't have uh, participation, I will call on people because I think that it's nice to hear a number of different voices so we don't hear from the same people again and again so that we can really say that we've, uh, we've all sort of engaged in the space here. And one of the reasons I do this is not so much because I think it's best practices. I mean, obviously it is, but it's also the fact that, you know, we're creating a learning crucible here. So the more that we get kind of buy-in and connectivity and the more, um, this is one of my tips that when I teach team coaching is that, you know, as soon as you get those people's voices in the room, the, the, the whole feeling of the room changes, right? This is nothing new. And so obviously when we've got 50, 100 people, whatever we're gonna get today on the session, that's probably not possible. But the more that we can have people sharing, putting into chat, being engaged, et cetera, we can still get that sense of people really buying in and I'm here to learn. And I know everybody's engaged anyway, but the more we can get some voices in, we get some cross-pollinization of what's happening in the field. So thank you for that. All right, so um, just a quick note, we're not gonna spend a lot of time on this, but just letting, letting you know, since Robbie talked about Turner International, we have the contract for David Clutterbuck um, work in team coaching. So we've taught um, that program for about eight years now. We've had a few hundred coaches go through that program locally. And then internationally, we've got in the thousands. So there are quite a number of team coaches that are out there today. And since we are talking about, um, we've already seen me, since we, um, since we're talking about kind of why team coaching today, I think that just like everything else in, in the coaching world, more and more people are getting qualified and certified. So qualified meaning getting the training, certified meaning getting the professional body standard, whether it's the ICF, ACTC, or the MCC credential for team coaching. So I imagine that clients are gonna start asking for what's your qualifications. So today um, I wanted to talk a little bit, I already started that on how ecosystems inform our work. And then we're going to deal a little bit about how do you work with the wider system? Because I think that the biggest mistake coaches make is if you're working one-on-one, -on -one, you think about the coachee in front of you and not the entire environment that they work in. Um, you know, what's the relationship with their manager or how are they feeling at home? Or what are some of the, the global economic um, influences that, that are coming into their team that um, make decision-making difficult, what have you. So how do we start thinking about engaging that? And then um, we are really, as, a, as an organization, Turner International is very focused on how do you create you know, a future focus to the organization? Why? Because things are so quick and moving. Like when I started doing the work, we were still doing you know, five to 10 year horizons. You know, these days when I work with teams, we're lucky if we do three-year horizons. And so it's just the nature of the way things are. And are we doing that as well? Because many of us, and I see many of you the same, you know, we're all getting a bunch of gray hairs now. So we've been in the workforce for a long time, as have our clients, right? So are we being nimble and adapting to what's happening in the organizational field as well? 
All right, so here's some of the key takeaways that I'm hoping that you might get today. And also we will talk about the um, what's required for the qualifications. So I wanted to talk a little bit about what's happening today. And one of the things, and, and Ravi will have seen this already um, because I talked about this in at, um, the MCC Global um, mm -hmm. program that I did recently. And one of the things that I really want to have people think about is what is needed to go from a one-to-one -to, -one to a one-to-many sort of, or a collective um, situation. And I know there's lots of research that's published out there about what the differences between teams and groups are. I've done a heap of work with Peter Hawkins as well. And we have gone toe-to-toe -to -toe about this because we disagree. Um, about the fact that to me, a team and a group are really hard to define these days because, you know, in general, the average person works for more than, you know, five teams, some as many as six or seven um, when they work in a large organization, maybe not for a small one, but even so, there's always teams forming or working parties forming and unforming to make decisions or because of a project or because um, a problem needs to be solved. And then if you look at a top team, oftentimes they are gold and or prefer to call their team that works for them, um, their team, not the team that they're actually a member of at the executive level. And so what actually is a team? So when, I hear, when you hear me talking about teams, think of groups, think of working parties, think of agile teams, think of, um, think tank groups, all of that. And I call it the collective sometimes. So we're talking about multiple people. Anyway, on this, what we, what I would really like to think about today is, or encourage us all to think about is what is different if you're out to sell this sort of solution, or if clients are asking you about it, like, What's the difference between the one-to-one -to, -one to the one-to-many environment? And I think that some of the main points are on this. You'll get a copy of this um, after the presentation today. So no need to do a bunch of note writing if you are not that sort of person. But, you know, part of it is the topics, you know, who, what are some of the issues that people are facing, right? Because oftentimes in one-to-one, -one, I'm more focused on myself. Whereas as the team, the major shift that we talk about is that you're trying to engage the whole, you know, as opposed to how do we function as a team or as a group, that might be one aspect, but how do we actually make decisions or what are the impacts of the global supply chain on this team today, for example, and that takes you out of the individual and into the collective, right? Those sorts of things. Um, and then the outcomes are collectively gold, not individually gold. So we are looking for not like, how does what I do as a leader impact on this team? That might be part of it, but it's also how do we as a leader um, support the people around us, regardless of whether or not we're on this team or whether or not we are on um multiple teams right and i think that that's the biggest mistake a team coach makes is that they get caught up to the individual rather and they do kind of hub and spoke so you look at an issue and then you call on each person and we'll talk about that in a minute but that's much more facilitation whereas team coaching is working with the collective so my question to everybody here is What's required, do you think, to go from one-to-one -to, -one to collective? Love to hear from a few people. And for those who are just joining, if you can come off camera, we'd love to see your faces and get people to come off of microphone and join in the conversation. Great. Pushka. Hi, Tammy. So Hi. first of all, thank you for the session. I think uh, from my perspective to get from an individual to collective coaching, I think it's the ability or the inherent, the inherent ability to be able to address and uh, 
communicate and relate to a group of people instead of one individual because it becomes easier when you're talking one on one but then to kind of hold the attention span of a group as compared to one person i think that's that 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 quality has to be be effectively used uh, in a groups a group session or collective coaching mm, absolutely yeah 100% thank you for that is it puish yeah puish yes so yeah. it's something similar to what you said it's basically zooming out and looking at the system system versus just that individual in isolation so the context becomes far more important even though it's important in one on one in collective coaching you just have to have it yeah absolutely and building on um what you're saying there i think that for me it's also being in alignment with the team around that because you know like do we actually know what what whatever it is the topic it is because we all bring our bias into that right so if the team is talking about um i don't know um how to raise money for a certain project or whatever i might have my own perspective around that and just like an in individual coaching i might accidentally get caught up into how i think they should solve it Whereas, you know, how do we make sure that they continue to solve it and that we're in alignment to what they're wanting? So really important point. So is it Par Parthiv? Hey, hi. Yes, this is my name is Parthiv. And uh, yeah, um, so I, I'm a little um, off the group here. I'm actually a business leader uh, leading a domain, business nice. domain and learning coaching as a skill, as a Two leader, so leader as a coach. And uh, what I feel, what's, what's very important, I, I often do, uh, a lot of my teams come collectively to me, uh, especially in stressful situations. Uh, uh, I often feel uh, in a group coaching kind of session, if, if the whole team who is coming to you is connected with one purpose, it becomes easier to bring them further on the purpose. Absolutely. Yep. Agreed. And other people have said that in, in the chat as well, you know, having that common goal um, and really looking at the goal from the organizational perspective, the outside in. So really, really important. And, you know, one of the things that I notice in teaching internal leaders and teams, team coaching is how do you give away control? You know, how do you actually have accountability between team members and not having to solve everything yourself. So, you know, in that shared shared responsibility, which we'll talk about a little bit as well today. So spot on on all of the things everybody's put in the chat box here, keep those things coming. All right, so this is from a recent um, study that was published in HBR by the ADP, which is an organization in the US and the only reason that I put this up here is the fact that, you know, notice the fact that when a team member is kind of autonomous and doesn't have a team, that they are not as engaged. And this kind of goes to what I talked about today about having all of us make sure that we're off camera, make sure that we're participating, all of that, because the higher the engagement, the more you feel part of it. Um, and then if you believe in your in your leader, then you even get more buy-in. But actually, if you're on a team and you really trust your leader, like they've got your, your best interest at heart, look at how, it, how much buy-in you've got. And this is such an important point for today's leaders and really looking at why team coaching is important. Because one-to-one, -one, oftentimes what happens is that you know, how many people have ever been hired for, oh, this, this employee is not doing their job or, you know, doesn't they, you know, like they just don't get on with so-and-so or whatever. And then you find out it's because the leader doesn't know how to manage. Right. <laughs> and so team coaching is great because even if the leader doesn't know how to manage well, you can be getting the team to start looking at how do they collectively work together better. And then that, let's say bad management, what have you, 
kind of increases to be better because the team starts believing in each other and that then systemically creates a different environment that they're working in, yeah. All right, so moving along here, we, uh, here are a lot of the global systemic issues that are going on here. Now, I'm not gonna talk a lot about these, but um, they're all things that everybody would know, right? If you have ever been to a cricket game in India, which I have before, and you can feel, you know, so-and-so comes on the field, you know, like, you know what global ecosystemic feels like, right? It's like, it's got that real palpable, you know, intensity to it. And so if we have social unrest or if we have uncertainty because of the pandemic um, or an us and them in a culture, people feel it, right? And that's the importance of this particular slide because then what's our role? How do we support that? How do we, because as soon as we go in there as an individual coach or as a team coach, we start becoming part of that system. So we feel it. So one of the tips is before you walk into a building or before you get into a session virtually with a client or with a team, you know, feel into it. What does it feel like before? What does it feel like when I start um, first meet that person or people? What does it then feel like if we, as we start working together and really trust that inner gut, you know, and make sure that you're, you're tied in because in a complex adaptive system, you are informed by what's happening in that system. And then you inform by what you say, they are changed as well. This is why coaching works, whether it's individual or collective, right? Everybody understanding this? Yeah, cool. So this is a new model that I have um, co-developed with my colleague, Michelle Lucas. And one of the reasons that I wanted to put it out here is that this gives us some insights as to what is happening in the moment and how do we work with a collective of people. It also works for one-to-one, -one, but it becomes really obvious when you start working with a collective. So what we're looking at is reflexivity, to, to kind of just give an overview here, is reflexivity is that capacity to do iterative learning. So you look at something, you say, I need to change it. You develop your plan with your coach, you or with yourself, and then you go out and you practice whatever that change is. And then you go back and you go, oh, I did that well, or, oh, here's something I need to improve around. And then you look at it again and you say, I'm gonna add this next level of complexity to it, right? That's reflexivity. And so on the, oops, sorry, on the bottom axis here, this reflexive maturity is around like, how much am I willing to put myself on the line? If I'm working with a group, you know, am I willing to actually speak up? Am I willing to share vulnerably what, um, what has been happening in my work? For example, if I'm in supervision, or if I'm on a team, you know, how I feel uncomfortable when we make decisions that aren't with the collective or what have you, right? Like how, what's your level of maturity and or to not throw a fit if things don't go your way, right? You know, everyone knows what we're talking about here. Whereas capacity is like, how do I feel? Like, do I have enough emotional buy-in to actually share? If I'm a team coach, do I feel like the team can actually take on board what is happening in the group collectively? Do I feel drained at the end of it because the team is so under-resourced and I feel that, right? So that's what capacity is about. So going up and down the spiral here is kind of a natural thing as you're working with it. The field of work is um, anything that's the content. What are we talking about? So seeing me is my own space, you know, what do I reflect on as a participant within that particular group or on my own when I'm not in that group, right? So what do I think about? What am I reflecting on? What are things I know about myself? Mm -hmm. Seeing alternative perspectives is when you start getting feedback from one or multiple people, 
what are some of the things that um, could be illuminated because they're in our blind spot because we didn't see it for ourselves or because a person comes from a different culture or a different um, thinking pattern or what have you. With seeing the system, this is like, can I broaden my perspective from my team to be on my team? Maybe the other teams that we're interacting with or our stakeholders or what, um, what things might be happening um, with the billing system, for example, that are impacting on this team. Seeing the complex adaptive system is much more tying the slide before that we just talked about with what are some of the global systemic things that are happening? You know, can we look beyond this team and look at the wider organization? Can we look at what's happening in India? Can we look at what's happening with the government? Can we look at what's happening on a global scale with, you know, all the warring that's going on, what have you, and how is that impacting on this team's ability to make decisions? Is that important? It may not be but it may be, and are they only looking at their own problem? Because just like with individual coaching, teams look at what's happening with themselves and they don't look out. And then team coaches come in and they go, oh, you're not working well together. So let's look at more at you and what you're not doing well, or what, what you could be doing well if you're a positive coach, take a, you know, a strengths-based approach. Whereas what we want them to do is start looking out first and go, oh my gosh, I'm part of a bigger whole. I work for an organization, you know, we're getting funding from this particular entity or we have governance from this particular place or, you know, what have you. And then seeing beyond is that magical part that every coach on the planet wants to get to. It's that, wow, we're in the groove. How do we all work together collectively to impact the greater whole right and it's not like we have like this is not linear you don't go from seeing me to seeing beyond and you go through all the steps that's not how this works what's going to happen is that you might step up to seeing the complex adaptive system and then i got to go back to myself right how do i actually um see the complex adaptive system, or maybe the whole team starts seeing the system first. So you're always bouncing around on these, but it's looking at all of the scope of things. And what you notice is that the more that people have a systemic understanding or a broader perspective, the bigger the field of work is, the more understanding and commonality that people have, the more that we can kind of solve problems from a different perspective. We can see other people's perspectives. We can engage differences of opinions and mindsets, et cetera. So this is one of the things that, um, that might be a great um, thing for us to have some questions about. So I'm gonna stop sharing the slides here, but what I wanted to see is maybe have some conversation about what are some of the systemic factors where team coaching might be supportive or um, anything else that we want to talk about, questions, what have you. So I'm going to pause here. So Priyush. Yeah, I had, I had a question. I wasn't clear the distinction between complex adaptive systems and seeing beyond. So what does beyond have which complex adaptive systems don't have? Yeah, seeing beyond is when people start being able to live it. So it's like, I, I recognize I'm part of the greater system and that what my contribution is matters. So when you're in the complex, when you're in the, um, gosh, I can't even remember the label of that particular one myself right now, seeing the complex adaptive system, when you're there, then that is much more about, um, you know, being able to see the fact that, oh yeah, for example, um, I did a project recently where, um, there was problems with invoicing, right? And so the team, um, the team leader came into that team meeting was just absolutely ropeable because they weren't getting paid. And so the CEO had called this leader and said, we're not getting paid. I'm going to sack everybody if you can't get this sorted, right? And you know, you wouldn't think about that. Like, so as a, if I was more of a relational team coach, then I'm going in and saying, okay, so um, 
whose fault is it? Like, I'm not saying that to the team, obviously, but in my head, I've got a hypothesis working like, okay, we got to go to finance or we got to go to the accounting people or we got to go to, um, you know, whatever the site supervisor and because it was in a mining site. But actually, well, how do we collectively understand what the problem is first, right? And then we start looking at the fact that, well, okay, we just installed a new software package. Now we got IT in the room. IT doesn't even have a seat at, this, at the table in this particular conversation, right? So that's an external um, person. We have a person who does the invoicing for the team in the room, but that person is not on finance. They're on this particular team. So they then have to interface with the finance team or the accounting team. I can't remember which it was now. And so they can start seeing the connections of the elements of other parts of the organization. But then if we just stop at that, then they're solving it from a rote perspective. Oh, you go talk to so-and-so, you go do this. Whereas what I did was encourage them to start looking at, okay, so what do other people feel is required to solve this problem, right? And then we start finding out that, well, actually, I, as an individual, am writing, handwriting my invoices out, and then I give it to my secretary. And I don't know where those are up to, because I haven't been trained on the new software, mm -hmm. right? And so do we need some training for this team now? So, you know, it's those sorts of things. And then by the end of the session, then people have a plan forward and everybody is engaged ab about, oh yeah, I'm actually part of the problem. By me handwriting my invoices out and giving it to my PA, I then am not participating in the way that the organization has intended me to do my invoicing. So maybe either myself or my PA needs to get um, some education and get trained on how to use the software, right? So, and it feels different when you're in the room because the team are all like, wow, it just opens up sort of this, like you're suspended, like um, in time. Yeah. Thank you. So what do, what do organizations need? What... Um, what are some of the systemic factors that you know that are happening in India right now or with your teams or groups where they could benefit from having some collective conversations with you? And I will call people. Hi, Laitha, how are you? I'm well, thanks. Nice to hear you again. Thank so, you. yeah, so I'll just pick an example of a recent team coaching assignment uh, that I'm working on. And we've had about a couple of sessions. And uh, what was a bit of a surprise uh, to the team was they were multi located. So, part of the team was in Singapore, and some of them in Bangalore and other parts of the country. And uh, the CEO is a very driven founder, and his uh, wife also works for the company and when the lead and they're both on the leadership team and when they got the team together one of the things that they recognized which to me was a surprise they didn't think of it before was the fact that the, the there is a dynamic in the team when uh, they are there as a couple and the rest of them, while they are all peers, uh, they're very guarded in how um, they have conversations, for instance. So even just opening up to that dynamic, I thought was very powerful for them. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And so I don't know if you can share, but it would be great to have people hear about, so how did you get the team engaged in solving that for themselves? So, uh, like I said, it's still a very early uh, engagement, uh, but a part of this conversation also then went into a discussion with the CEO himself because he reached out uh, separately, was uh, to share that now that you have this awareness, what are you going to do about it? And he said, we need to spend more time together physically as a team 
uh, is one of the realizations and have more focused conversations on a collective goal because what had also happened was it had become very siloed, which is why they called in a team coach. So those are some of the conversations that are underway. Nice. Yeah. So, and you can see then, isn't this such a great example about the fact of just by one tiny factor in a system, how it can then, you know, once you illuminate it, once you, you put some focus on it, then that opens the field and then people have a different perspective of it. And then that then leads us more towards understanding, okay, who I am matters, who I am in this conversation is making impact. Even if I'm doing nothing, it still has impact. Yeah, thank you. So I'm going to call on a couple of people here to say about, you know, what do you think is some of the need? What do you, what are organizations wanting in India? So this is an important point. So I see Morali is right in the middle of my screen here. I'm wondering if you might come off mute and share some suggestions for us, please. Morali, are you there? Nope, not there. All right, what about um, Kenneth? Nope, are people popping off, Robbie? You're on mute. Yep, yeah. uh, I don't find Kenneth here. Then. Okay. But Murli is certainly here. Okay. Hmm. All right. So um, how about Smita? Smita. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so this is not something that, um, you know, I have so like i was i was talking about this thing in the uh, um comment section that i was saying a lot of the team i think it it sometimes is very important that uh, you know people do come across as um, do you know really what's going on right because uh, people especially if they are in hybrid work i think today the context in in the indian organizations a lot is that we are in the hybrid working uh, model which means a lot of conversations are transactional so does it mm. go uh, slightly beyond or deeper than transactional is a question i think that most teams struggle with uh, today you know even in the context that lata was sharing um, what really happens is that uh, the bonds are not deeper or do we, uh, even though we've spent years together as a team, uh, do we really know people beyond their role designation and responsibility? Yeah, exactly. Well, and also, you know, do we, to me, I, I also have to say, like, do you notice for yourself that, you know, like we have sort of a judgment or a bias around the fact that they should be beyond that transactional. Uh, but, uh, okay. So, um, yeah, I, it may sound like a bias when you put it across like that, but for a team to come together and uh, solve whatever underlying conflicts may be or build an element of trust, um, to be able to really come and, um, you know, we talk about concepts like psychological safety, your ability to be really vulnerable, uh, express yourself. There is a little bit of deeper relationship sometimes that need to get established um, for some of those elements to really come up in a team. Otherwise, the struggle will always be there. At least that's my experience because I facilitate a lot of leadership programs across organizations, and that's what comes up as a challenge time and again. Mm, yeah, and and I think that it, you know it's it's I'm so glad. Thank you so much for being so honest and and forthcoming here because this is such a, an important topic. What what we're going into here and why I specifically used you know 
judgment, bias, those sort of languages to get people to start thinking. Not because what Smitha has said is there's anything wrong. Like we all have that, right? Um, and, you know, one of the things that I noticed, particularly because I've done a lot of work in the executive level of organizations, is that people actually do not need to like each other to work well together. And it, you know, it it's against sort of my, my way of how I like to work, but equally they, many people have gotten that sort of level of, I'm here to do a job and as long as I can get something done, it's fine. Um, so I think that's something to take to supervision as well. If you notice that the team is not making progress because you're trying to impose that on, and I'm not saying that Smith is doing that, but it's a good point for everyone because systemically many coaches have that perspective, right? But I think that the other thing is that, that you've opened up here, Smith, for us is that, you know, we, um, if we go back to that slide that I had on the screen from Harvard Business with the trusting your leader, like what are the elements of trust? Because trust is a one-to-one -one construct, right? So I might need to trust my leader. I might need to trust my teammate. I might need to trust my EA. But do I need to trust everybody on the team? No, because I don't interact with them every single day. Do I need to have psychological safety, which is a collective construct psychological safety for those who don't know is that ability to speak up and feel like you're not being judged and so that's collective so if say for example smitha and i were on a team together and i let her down because i missed deadlines again and again she doesn't trust me anymore does she all right but you know, I might be on the team with a number of other people and they don't have that experience of me and they can feel the fact that we're not working well together. So they might be able to help us in working out better, but we can still get things done and make decisions in a, in a team construct. And so even though Smith and I are having difficulties, you know, uh, Raka might be willing to kind of step in and help us so that we can get something done. Or Rajiv might be somebody who um, calls it out and says, hey, we need to talk about this in the team. And if we've got enough psychological safety to do that, that is awesome. We can collect that. We can collectively work on that, which is what our job is as, the, as a team coach. Yeah. So really, really rich to know the differences of those, which is something that you will learn in a team coaching training program, anyway, the ones that I teach. I imagine you would in others as well. But Smitha, does that help or did you have more for us around that? Um, but uh, you left me with a thought. I'm really going to uh, think about that concept. I, for me, that statement you just made that, you know, I you don't have to like someone to work well. Uh, with them in a team is something that I really like to ponder on because a lot of times in programs that I facilitate, which may not be a team coaching piece, but sometimes in facilitation, a lot of people come up with questions like, like this. This will be an interesting thing to take back and understand a little more deeply. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. I think that, you know, more what I, when that comes up, I talk about, you know, like respect like, can you respect the work that they're doing? Can you respect the contribution that they make? Because that's different than liking someone and wanting to go out to dinner or, absolutely, absolutely. you know, what have you. So that sometimes can bring teams together a little bit easier. Now, I know that there was somebody who had their hand up um, and they've gone off. Who is that? I had my ha hand up, uh, Tammy, oh, but I think there's somebody else as well. Excellent. Uh, well, why don't you take the space, please? Yeah. So for me, it was more about the generational um, differences that are there within a team, right? So we have people from a Gen Y, you have people from a Gen X. Um, so sometimes, and again, going back to the conversation we were, we were having, they might appear, you know, the Gen um, Y might appear to be very transactional in their behavior and their interactions, but they're very cued into what is happening. So if mm. we take, take a you know cookie cutter approach and say that 
uh, they need to be in tune in a particular way, it may not really cut ice with them because a certain amount of flexibility might be required, especially when, you know, and we want to have this reverse uh, mentoring from team members, especially now when with a whole lot of technology uh, discussions coming in and probably the digital natives. And so it's a lot more easier for them to embrace the bots and the AIs. And, you know, we are kind of keep, keeping pace with all of it. So sometimes it helps to, uh, you know, look at it from a different set of lens that they really don't, we can't expect them to fall in line because even in a team coaching, then it becomes very difficult to expect everyone to behave in a certain manner. And somewhere mm -hmm. we might have to drop some of those expectations and kind of go a little open into uh, these conversations because then it becomes a lot more real, right? So that's been my, you know, uh, that's been my experience. But I also want to place it out here to get a sense of. But will it make it too flexible and too open? And how has been everyone else's experience uh, in the team coaching space, especially with regard to, you know, uh, the generation part, intergenerational mm -hmm. aspect? Yeah, nice. Does anybody want to respond to that about working with multi generations and how, how can you manage some of that? That's the question there. Is that right? Yeah. So I can take a dab, so because I have experience working with multi-generation. So I was typically in the offshoring industry where there's a lot of young crowd that keeps coming and especially with contact centers, et cetera. And plus then because of the, the, the higher up that you go in the hierarchy, you have AVPs, VPs that used to report to me. And the way you approach them is definitely going to be different because say for the younger generation is that gen x i don't know so is that I, I think that's gen x right the 20s and 30s is today so whatever that those right. are called <laughs> the gen y sorry <laughs> get confused all the time so so the gen y's i think they're a lot more opinionated than what we were or the senior folks are and uh, and and i think they need a lot of reasoning and logic to everything that and how we approach them as compared to maybe some of the senior folks who are more accustomed to kind of doing what is required and then asking questions. So I think the way you approach them has to be very difficult. So with the Gen Y, you go with to them with the right structure, with the right logic. And once they agree to it, then, then of course, they will support you throughout. So I think that's the key difference of the approach I used to take, especially. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Pushkar. Definitely resonates. I think the other thing is, too, is that regardless of, you know, there's always going to be differences. Like I tend to be, um, you know, that saying a cat amongst the pigeons. I tend to be a little bit like that, you know, a bit of a maverick in that, you know, people, regardless of age, regardless of background, regardless of, you know, thinking or whatever, people want to be heard. Like that's the common thread, probably. And so... Oftentimes, I think that we step into the space of feeling like we need to solve, fix, um, support, those sorts of things. Whereas actually, when you go from being a less experienced individual coach to a master coach, the number one thing that is in that journey is that the client is whole, right? We talk about that from the day dot you learn how to coach, but actually you actually need to leave it with the client that they're going to solve it. And if they don't, that it doesn't reflect badly on you. And that's the same thing when you work with teams and groups about the fact that the team is a collective and they need to be the ones who solve it. They need the one, they need to be the ones who look at how do they work together. And so I agree about the fact that, yeah, what's the structure that we need to do to engage, but also how do we really support everyone being heard? How do we really bring it down to, okay, we've got differences of opinion or we think differently or we're different generations. Like how do we make sure everybody's voice is in the room? And it sounds really simple. It's hard to do, but you know, if we start getting too prescriptive around do this, or, you know, here's the intervention that works for this generation, or here's the intervention that works for people in um, Japan or whatever it happens to be, or here's the, here's the way that you should work with people who are on the spectrum, then it ends up really feeling artificial to the people who are receiving it. 
So it's good to educate yourself about it, but equally, you know, how do you get them to own their own reality? You know, if I'm frustrated because I'm 30 years old and I'm working with a bunch of old people, it's good to have that conversation and get them to, to start sharing, okay, what's it like? And or vice versa for the person who's old to say, you know what, I feel a little intimidated by somebody who knows so much. So that's where we can also play ball in that too. So I know we had two hands up. I know one was Winston, but his came before whoever the other person was. What can yeah. that- Yeah, Tammy, I, I would say that they should be on the same wavelength. If you're not you on the wavelength is you got to, it'll only resonate if you all think alike. So and the tuning in has to be right. So tell me more about that because like I kind of go into, well, is it possible for me to think like you? See, when you think of music, you've got different notes. And the only way you can get the correct tone is that they have to blend together. If the right. notes don't blend, then you don't get the correct music. Yeah. So the only way resonate would come about if they're all on the same wavelength. Hmm. Well, and, you know, you bring up a really great point there, Winston, because, like, I think that this is where we, as team coaches, can sometimes get caught into that, um, uh, you know, like, I'm the master and controller of the team. <laughs> yes, because, yes. You know, you're yeah. not, not the conductor of that music. Yeah. They are. And so, yes, we do want that as an outcome, but who's actually yeah. the conductor then within that team? Actually, when you look at teams, uh, we banish, banish that completely, don't we? In team coaching, we don't have hierarchy. Hierarchy is completely banished. Mm. We are all on the same, same wavelength. And that's what I meant by, you know, resonating with one another. Mm, yeah, yeah, exactly. And how do you kind of support the team in in having the sound that they want collectively? <laughs> like that's using well, your metaphor, right? Like yeah, this one well, might be a jazz team. This one might be heavy metal. Yeah. The other one might over here might yes. be, you know, Bollywood <laughs> style. You know, you don't know. <laughs> yeah. Classical. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Tammy, if I may, Suparna here. <laughs> Welcome. Just, hi. Are you, so, are, are you in the wavelength here as well? <laughs> I'm here and I, I wanted to respond to Winston with the metaphor <laughs> which he has picked up and, uh, the, and how you were responding to the metaphor because what I heard him saying was really it's a paradox uh, or some kind of a struggle where He's using this whole metaphor from the point of view of getting harmony in the team because music Absolutely. is about harmony. And uh, Tammy, what you've been talking about is how do we get different voices in the room? So um, it, how do we do it in a way where, you know, we, there is no discord or even if there is an initial discord, it transitions into something which is more like in harmony. So, and that would be the process which would be steered by the collective. Uh, yes. And, I think that's that's what I hear uh, us talking about. Yeah, absolutely. And it's both, isn't it? Yeah, <laughs> it is. It is. Like, it's not an either or. And uh, yeah. I think uh, it was Smitha who spoke about, uh, or was it uh, the person who spoke right after her? And so there, there, is, there was a case just last month, uh, we were talking to an organization, and uh, the classic thing was that this is a hybrid of post-COVID uh, hybrid work culture. So the dominant group, which is a senior group, thinks uh, that the better way is to get them to office. And obviously the Gen Z is resisting that. So then there is that <laughs> inevitable generational uh, drift, which has come into the workplace. And one has actually taken a position that this is superior. So there is a judgment and there is a you know thing. So it would come down to exploring values. I mean, what is a, a priority for one generation? And the way we did something is not uh, true anymore for the generation which is you know joining the workplace. 
So uh, some un unlearning by the dominant uh, senior people and uh, and of course, you know, creating that space. So I can see how, how much this is, uh, you know, a classic example maybe where the need is, the need of the hour in the industry, especially with startups and uh, the new tech firms. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Uh, so, Penny, Superana's point, at the uh, current uh, scenario, we are banished, we have banished hierarchy completely. There is no hierarchical structure. It's we are all in the same playing field. So, mm -hmm. we the only way we can get the youth to participate, Gen Y, X, Y, Z, is to give them that flow to come in and participate. Hierarchy is banished no. completely. In the new so, gen, generation, we don't have any hierarchy. So it's global, a mortal sin to have. Yeah. Superna. <laughs> so global, <laughs> uh, I think the uh, the concept of circular economies <laughs> and circular conversations, yeah. it, it is, we are looking at a more democratic uh, system. And uh, in that, because hierarchies, I think we associated yeah. with the animal kingdom. There's always, you know, the yeah. there's one dominant alpha, and then there are there is power. And inevitably, in organizations, that that is inevitable. But I think this is really an invitation to see what can change. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, you know what we're talking about here. There's some great points in the chat as well. Um, what we're talking about here, um, and then I'm gonna ask um, Savananda, <laughs> as I'm inelegantly butchering your name, my apologies there, um, is, uh, is gonna come in, is that, you know, think about the fact that this is no different than what we're living in today. Yeah. You know, that us and them, or the I'm this age, or my peer group says, or, I'm a stay-at-home mom, or I am, you know, however we identify ourselves right now, being an individual is really important. People are holding on quite tightly to that. Whereas, you know, I posit to everybody as a professional coach, how does that actually support, you know, the communities we live in? And is it more that if I look back at when I was, you know, 25 years old, didn't I have the same priorities at that age? Didn't I want to be tied into my company? Didn't I want to buy a house and or didn't I want to have kids or whatever those things, those values are. Whereas when I got into my 40s, I was much more about spending time with my family or making sure that we had a nest egg for the future, right? Like, how is that different as a thinking about how I relate to rather than you know, kind of labeling people because that's what we've been taught because it's a good way that, you know, we can kind of look at relating to people, but does it help when we label them? So yes, please, Sivananda. Uh, thanks, Tammy. So yeah, I think I was just wanted to uh, share my thoughts around it because I, I used to work as an agile coach in the team context, right? I think, you know, uh, and Winston said that, you know, we have banished the hierarchy, right? And then now we are more of, you know, going through the flow. But then if you look at it, I think that's that's not in the spirit. I think that's only in the letter, right? Because if you look at the organizations, I think that's what we are talking about, right? We are talking about the organization's teaming, right? And, exactly. Right? Yep. So the, the, the teams in the organizations should have that sense of belongingness. That's where I think you know, they could achieve the common goal, right? So if you look at it, all the generations are there and hierarchy is also there, right? The namesake, the hierarchy is not there. They say that it's a flat structure. No, not, not at all. So I wanted to kind of hear from you, right? As a team, experienced a team coach, right? Our expert in the team coaching, right? So when we try to, you know, help the teams to work collectively, right? Um, trying to remove the silos, right? Mm. And the the common barrier that we see is the generation gap, again, and the biases, right? Yeah. And the hierarchy, of course. 
right? What is these are all running as a common threads, right? Across the groups and the teams, right? So if you ask me, I think getting that sense of belongingness, right, and thinking that collectively and marching towards a common objective to achieve, right, is what going to make the teams actually, you know, teams, um, right? Not for the namesake. So I think that's that's what I think you know collective that's what the the common challenge that we have in Indian organizations not only in Indian organizations if you look at it particularly any organization for that matter right and then egos comes into play right when the when the when the leader is there and of you know there is a lot of resistance um, from the leader's standpoint right not being coached and they're not coachable of course uh, as far as I'm concerned because I have kind of uh, worked as a six years as a coach, then I could see the difference uh, from the leader to the other team members, right? The egos also play a, a bigger role, right? How can we kind of deal with that? I think, you know, unless we have that common objective, unless we have that sense of belongingness, yeah, it's going to be a challenge for us. Yeah, yeah. And you've set me up perfectly. You did not know this, but what I was going to talk about was this idea about how do we foster collectivism? Um, and I think that that's what, uh, I'm, I'm going to quickly go through this and then that might um, answer your question and or uh, help in the next piece of the conversation so that um, we can look at this. So to me, um, you know, many people will have seen Amy Edmondson's work on teaming, right? This is about how do we collectively work together? And as team coaches, how do we actually um, support that, that interaction and, you know, get those egos out of the room or, you know, get to have people look at themselves in relation to other people, regardless of what they're nationality, age, um, religious perspectives, um, political, you know, what have you are. So what I'm, what, what I'm seeing is that a lot of organizations are struggling with things that we've started talking about already today. We've gone in generationally, but then there's also the things like hybrid working, which people have talked about here. But what about um, just strain? Uh, uh, can't speak here. What about plain old business as usual issues? You know, like I talked before about the invoicing, right? Um, making making decisions or having temporary. What I'm seeing a lot of temporary teams, right? We've got an issue. We need um, a group of people to get together, solve it, and then disband. Or um, we need a, a um, I've put this image deliberately on here because if you work in healthcare, oftentimes they are, they don't even know the people that they work with at all. They are on a roster and they go in for that shift and then they see that person, you know, in six months time or what have you. And same thing on your airlines, right? Is that when you go on a plane, um, you don't get the same intact team, you get a group of people who come together to serve you food and make sure that you get from point A to point B and give the safety demo, right? So, but they team, right? They know that the common objective. So what um, uh, Sivananda was, was just saying is so true about the fact that, you know, if we've got that common understanding of my job is to get people safely from point A to point B, that's where we can all team together. So how do we, make it so that teams or groups, collectives can have real strong understanding and identification with what that thing is. So I think that, and this is my, this goes back to quite a couple of questions and comments people had. Thank you so much for participating about how do we go, oops, how do we go from, from, um, you know, kind of a 
individually focused or siloed team where they're only thinking about their selves, themselves or how do we reach our KPIs. And especially in India, in my experience of doing team coaching, there's a lot of focus on being the best or getting the outcome or, you know, making the making budget or what have you. And it's more around how, how are we going to do that then? Yes, we want to make budget. How do we engage stakeholders to make sure that what we're selling matters? Or, you know, do we need to offer certain kinds of discounts? And if so, is it we're making the decision in isolation just as a team? Or are we actually going out to the wider area and bringing that into the team? And also, how do we create opportunities for the team to reflect how they're doing? And this goes to everybody's point about the fact that if we don't have that psychological safety to say, you know, look, I'd rather work from home three days a week um, and feel that they can say that and be heard, that's a different paradigm than saying it and then having everybody in the team be judgmental or being the lone voice of saying that. And, you know, can the team actually say, well, maybe you can't work three, but maybe Every other, once a month, you can work three days a week from home and the rest of the time you can work one and a half days from home or whatever it happens to be. But what are those solutions beyond what the what the person or people need in that team so that they are collectively um, doing working in tandem, having that music that Winston talked about so that we're we're creating some sort of um, harmonious output together. So for those of you who have seen Amy Edmondson's work, this is an extension on this, is that in order to create that learning environment, which is what we've been talking about, the idea here is that failure, which people recoil from when you bring up, um, is part of learning. And so how do we create safe experiments as teams? Or how do, how do bosses, I know, I can't remember who said earlier, but someone had mentioned that they're an internal coach. Like, how do you promote learning? How do you take that opportunity to use your coaching skills to see about, oh, what did we learn when we did this the last time, et cetera. So these are some ideas for you about how you can create that learning environment. And the model that I'm going to share with you today, for those of you who've learned from me, this has been around for a while, um, is around contracting. So the big difference here is that how many people bought a house, bought a car, what have you? You know, most people have, I'm sure, who are on here, if not everybody. And what happens is you negotiate the contract, you bargain, you get the price you want, you sign the piece of paper, and then you put it in a drawer and you never look at it again. And so what happens is that most coaches go in, they win the deal, and then they never look at the contract again. Or they get into the room and they go, oh my gosh, like what I thought we were going to be dealing with here were a group of people who work well together and they just need a little bit of help in understanding what the new mission is for the organization. Well, actually, there's a lot of politics that are going on underneath and the contract is totally different. So what do I need to renegotiate with the team that's in front of me or with the individual that's in front of me so that I know we're on the same page? So I'm going to leave you with this model today and love to hear if anybody's used this model who's done our program before um, to any great effect. But just walking you through this very quickly is that what happens is that most people want a shared outcome, right? We all want to go get things done, do great things together, deliver whatever it is we said we would back to the organization. And so what do we do? We then try and look for who's responsible for this part of the outcome. Who is Who then ultimately is accountable? So in my book, only one person can be accountable. And that's the person who has the budget, who has resources, who will get fired as a result of that outcome, right? Um, or lose face or whatever it happens to be. Whereas a responsibility, many, many people can have responsibility for an outcome. But what happens is that 
we thought that when we walked out of the room, we all knew what we were responsible for. But then I I go away and I, I, I am a bit unclear. I kind of don't know what I thought that I said. I then go to Ravi and as my offsider and say, hey, what did I think that I should do? What do you think I should do? This is what I think. He and I come up with something. I come back to the team and it was completely wrong. And then I get judged for not having the right thing. Why? Because although I did shared understanding a bit, he and I didn't hear what the team wanted. So collectively, the team then needs to go back in and look at what do we actually understand what was required? And what ends up happening oftentimes is that if I feel judged, I go below the line. I go, oops, um, I go below the line and I start and I start saying, oh, no, it wasn't me. I went and I talked to Robbie. He, he backed me on what I said. Da, da, da. Well, that doesn't help anyone, does it? And so I've gone below the line. Ravi, I pulled him along with him and everybody else on the team is like, okay, well, you know, we need to get this done. What do we do? So we miss the shared understanding bit. Like it's like, it's not even there because we're so focused on getting the outcome. Whereas my invitation is, is that for us as coaches, the more that we can get curious and role model that curiosity or have some compassion for the difference of ages or the difference of voices that are in the room, the more that we can have the courage, you know, show courage about, okay, so what actually is needed here? Do we need to take a moment to reflect, have some mindfulness about what's unfolding in this moment? Then we can have a better shared understanding. Then we can go to what's the outcome that we want, who's responsible. And so whenever you find that there is a misunderstanding, you need to come back to a shared understanding. What collectively do we need to do? Or maybe something shifted in the organization. So you'll get a copy of this. And then there's an article about how to use this with teams that you'll get as well today around this. So I want to know about how, as a result of what we talked about today, how do we engage that wider collective? What are some of those things that you're starting to notice from as a result of today's dialogue. And then I wanna spend about 10 minutes or so doing Q&A and talking about the accreditation and next steps for everybody. So engaging the collective, what have you learned? Latha says, I like the alignment with the courage. I'm going to call on Sidai because she looks very, um, uh, very pensive. Something good is going on in that brain. You know, um, lots of, uh, lo lots of food for thought here. Engaging the collective, I think, I mean, you know, just listening to everything. I was just thinking about the different um, teams that I have worked with and within and I think engaging the collective is really important because it, it when you were able to harness that energy, when you're able to do two things, one is help them be aware of their place within the within the system. And, you know, the example we had earlier also, how there are so many connections within the system and, and then tap into that collective energy within that uh, uh, connection. I think there's a lot of, um, uh, there's a lot that happens within that uh, um, I want to say nexus, but I know that's not the right word here. Uh, where those two meet, essentially, us mm. in the larger context and us, the, the, the energy of us. So that's what I was thinking about. Yeah, nice. And that applies what you're talking about, whether you're working one to one or one to many. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great insight. Amrita? Yeah, so uh, I can talk about my team. And uh, so I work for a company which is owned by a promoter. And it's very different in a promoter-owned company than uh, when you have a CEO who is working as an employee. And recently the organization had undergone a lot of changes. So we had, uh, we suddenly have been appointed with an executive director to the board of directors. And so the current CEO 
felt threatened because he was um, employed by the promoter of the company. That is leading to uh, a lot of uh, organizational structural change and um, the team is pensive. Um, they are missing out on, on certain basic things of thanking, recognizing, giving. And uh, this, this line, what you are showing, right? The, the uh, below line uh, where everyone is so much focused towards um, getting the things done. Um, and I am also to blame for that um, as the leader of the team that um, we are not really reflecting, not really thinking about the shared outcome, the overall goal where we need to focus on. So great session and a lot of inputs. I um, uh, have to think about how can I get the team together, have a conversation around uh, shared outcome, have some reflection, uh, have shared, remind them about the shared responsibilities uh, so that we don't lurch at the bottom line. Hmm. Yeah, nice. And really spend time, um, you know, exploring what's our shared understanding because that's what's the goal in the in those reflective moments, isn't it? So, let us know how you go around that. I'd love to hear more. So I published that model back in two thousand fourteen. So it's now ten mm -hmm. years old. So mm -hmm. people, a, a few people have found that it's quite useful, and you know, you can also. Um, actually use it as a process with your team. You can teach it to them. It's, um, you know, it's, it's fine to share. Um, and, and people will start getting it because it's simple, right? So yeah, I'd love to hear about that. Yeah. We've got time for one more person to share. How about, um, I'm going to absolutely try my best on this name here. Thero, 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 Vendagamya. <laughs> I butchered it, right? Can you tell me how to pronounce it? Yeah, you can just call me Tiro. Tiro. Okay, I love that. I'll take that. Thank you. How would you normally Tiro. say it? Though? With the lovely with the lovely Indian accent. Yeah. Um, so in terms of team coaching, I haven't done much of team coaching and I have only done individual coaching. So it's all learning to me, but the specific aspect which I'm trying to come to terms with is moving from solving the problem to the person, which is what we are taught in terms of the individual coaching. So we focus on the person and not the situation or the problem as against in the in this environment that we are discussing here. I see an element of understanding of the situation is required to even if we are still focusing on the people who are you know a collection of you know persons but we seem to be kind of moving into a facilitator role to understand the situation and uh, on the other hand when I'm on an individual coaching, I don't do that at all. I mm. stay away from the situation and the problem and leave it to him or her and just only focus on what is the impact of whatever is happening on you type. So that's the major thing that I'm I'm kind of observing as to as you are all discussing. And I'm I'm new to team coaching. Well, thank you for sharing that. And I think it's a great pickup, even though that you're, um, you're new to team coaching is, um, is the fact that you understand the difference that if you're facilitating, it's that you have a perspective or you've been hired to be the subject matter expert, or you're bringing some sort of content in that, you know, then uh, teaches the team. And that's needed in team coaching sometimes as well. Like you can't just walk in usually with teams. You have to do a little bit of facilitation or training or what have you. But it's that when we hold on to that and we don't allow the team to do their own stuff or we think they need to go in a certain direction. And that's where the ethics of team coaching get into play. 
And I know that I'm going to segue us into some of the conversation around um, what's next for um, team coaches to get certified and all of that, if that's okay with you guys, um, is that, so I've sat on a lot of the kind of team uh, uh, conversations with the professional bodies about, you know, how do we recognize what team coaching is? And I think that what's challenging is that um, it's a bit like individual coaching, like, you know what it is, you know, when you see it, but defining it, everybody has a different definition, like the professional bodies all have a different definition. I have published definitions of these things that are different from the professional bodies, for example, right? So we all think that we've got the magic juice to be able to define whatever that thing is. Um, but I would say that in general, what I just said is the big differentiator that we need to be looking out for, because just like in one-to-one, -one, it's not your job to define the client goal. It's theirs. It's not your job to know the direction that they're going to take. You can suggest it, you can contract with them about it, but they actually are the ones who have to come up with it. So all of the skill that you've got as a one-to-one -one needs to go into a one-to-many sort of context and letting go of control and dealing with uncertainty is a bit tricky. I think that would be the number one thing that I see with coaches is, oh my gosh, you know, like I said, they were going to be done in five sessions and they're just now understanding that they're a team. And, you know, how do you then negotiate that and not take control of, oh, well, here's what we got to get over the line by the end of the fifth session or whatever. So those are some of the things where supervision really comes into its own. With regard to, um, I'm just going to share screen here for a second because um, this might be helpful to understand about what, um, what's, ha what's happening. Now, we're obviously offering um, programs. You're welcome to sign up for those. But I, I just wanted to share this screen as well about sort of like what's the lay of the land. So if you want to become a professional team coach, most practitioners who are um, have been doing team co doing individual coaching for five or six years step straight into practitioner. Um, there are programs out there. We don't teach it, but you can start at kind of like a basic level, which is called foundation. GTCI has one. Um, there are a number of short programs that do that. But I would say most people who are coaches need to start kind of at this practitioner level. And they these sorts of programs are typically three days of time in total. Ours is actually virtually and um, we do it over a three month period and you get the same number of CCEUs for that. Um, then you go to the next part, which is senior practitioner. And that's for people who have, you have to do practitioner and then senior practitioner because it is an accredited course. And whether it's our program or anybody else's program on the market, if you are an ICF um, qualified or accredited program, then you will have to do something like this because I don't think there's a single program on the market today that gets you the number of hours you need to apply for the ACTC. So that's why I wanted to show this slide is not only because I, I wanted to, I guess, promote the program, but also to let you know that it's the same as if you're getting a PCC level qualification as a team coach at the senior practitioner level. And that's what the ACTC is, is that you are qualified, you've done X number of hours with your team, X number of hours in training. And there's also a, um, a whole process you have to go through, which involves doing um, an exam. So you don't have mentoring inbuilt like you do in individual coaching for the ICF, ACTC. You only have the learning and inbuilt in the learning is things like supervision. And if you don't take a program, like our program for senior practitioner has supervision inbuilt into it. Whereas a number of programs do not have that. So please ask for that because with the ACTC, you have to have 10 hours of supervision in order to graduate, in order to apply um, for your ACTC. So instead of mentoring, they've taken it to supervision. Um, and then we have ongoing um, 
professional development and we've got some supervision groups this I don't know why it says in June and we've got some starting in September so this must be an old slide my apologies so here's um, some of the the information about the program I'm not going to spend time on that you can look at our website find that about it etc here are a couple of books that um, I would recommend at a minimum for those of you who are new into team coaching um, here's kind of the book that many um, programs, including ours, recommend, and it's got kind of like, here's all of the stuff you might want to know in order to have um, an, a foundational understanding of what team coaching is, how people, some of the techniques they used, and some of the, the processes that you might follow. This book that I co-wrote with David Clutterbuck and Cole Murphy, this one is also required reading for the program, but this one is different. This is case studies. So there are 23 cases, I think 26 or 28 authors who have written cases in here. And you can talk, you can see like, oh yeah, um, I'm doing a program that's like X. Is there something in the book that also has something like X? So it's not a book that I would suggest you probably pick up and read cover to cover. It's an opportunity. Both of them actually are books you pick up and you kind of go, here's what we might um, want to look at for this particular instance. You put it back on your bookshelf, you pull it down again. So here's my closing slide um, that I'd love to leave you with. And then I want to just take any last burning questions and I'm happy to stay a little bit longer if anybody has those. But you know, how do we open people up to learning and change is what I wanted to leave people with and really look at that collectivism because what we're doing in our own client base is actually supporting the greater whole. So what you do in your individual or team group coaching sessions is actually goes out to your communities and then those people go into their communities and those people go into voting or go into making decisions in their organizations. So remember that what you do matters. So thank you so much, everyone. What last minute questions do people have before you pop off, if any? I know we got to close here. Ravi, do you have anything to say? And I'm happy to stay on. Shalini? Yeah, Shalini. Shalini. So I, though I am uh, not into team coaching, I'm exploring it, but I'm a leadership coach for almost a decade now. And when I get people from the organization saying that this guy is not performing well and you can work with him or her. And most of the time it happens that, you know, while exploring with the client, we get to know and we hear the same kind of story that not being heard, the environment is like this, the boss is like that, you know. So when we are just working on this team coaching and we can just work with the team and on the collectiveness and, you know, uh, just uh, giving them a common objective and goal and the shared understanding, but what would we do with that environmental factors that if an organization has a culture of that, you know, being the best, who's the best? And they don't even know. I mean, maybe they do it consciously or unconsciously, but they really, you know, create that internal rivalry and then politics and a lot of other things, you know, without knowing. And then when some somebody goes ahead and somebody left behind and they have their own grudges and they stop performing because they don't have the sense of belongingness, there is no ownership and they feel like, oh, I don't want to work with. So how can we address this point in the team coaching? Yeah, it's a big question, that one. Um, I would say I would have you read um, Project Aristotle which is um, an article that you can get online. And it's um, the New York Times um, write-up of why psychological safety is important for organizations. So, you know, some of the things around um, that you've mentioned around, you know, kind of what I would call tribalism <laughs> um, in organizations, it's hard to break. But with team coaching, if we can create those pockets of psychological safety, you know, and that team de defines their tribe and it is 
let's say, more supportive rather than against what the organization is trying to achieve, that's where the magic comes in. Could you please mention the name of the article in the chat box that I can? Yeah, yeah I would do a search mm -hmm. on Project Aristotle. I'll type it in here. Thank you. I can't. I can't circulate it because it's a um, it is a um, uh, what do you call it? It's a restricted document, so I can't circulate it. But um, but if you do a search on that in Google, it will bring up the article, and you can either buy it or find somebody who's written about it or whatever. Sure, I will. Thank you so much. Well, shall we leave it there today, Ravi? Do you sure. think? So I'm both thankful and grateful to you, Tammy, for taking the time out to host the masterclass for us this evening. I'm also very thankful to uh, Kim for being supportive in the process, uh, I would say, end to end. And thank you, everyone, for joining us this evening. Our next masterclass is scheduled on August 8th. So I'm looking forward to seeing all of you there again. Until then, uh, wish you all the very best and have a great evening ahead and a lovely uh, rest of the week too. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you all. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Thank you, Tammy. Bye -bye. Thank you, Tammy and Ravi. Thanks. You're on mute, Winston. You're on mute, Dr. Winston. Thanks, Tammy and Ravi. That was a very interesting session. Oh, a pleasure. Thanks for joining. And, uh, You're most welcome. Yeah, good to meet you. Go well. Yeah, wonderful. Yeah. We'll meet again in Bangalore. Yes, definitely. You better. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. So do you want to stop the recording, Robbie? I have... Uh...